over. All right, friends, welcome back. I'm the Zim. This is the Zim video. This is another hey friends, welcome back. Dude, I'm the Zim. show called Conversation. Oh, your audio is up. I'm hearing. Hold on. Sorry. That's okay. <laughs> Just mute the video. Just like on the YouTube side. And then we'll be good. Okay. Yeah, there we go. Anyways, we got a quick introduction to Mike here, Mike Levitt. So anyways, let me go back. Um, this is Conversations with Creative. Sometimes we do this on this channel where we do live interviews of other creative people. And today we're talking with Mike Levitt and he's a old friend of mine from high school. I talked to him once before on an old podcast I had called, what was it called? MFA Chronicles at the time, I think. Um, so if you're into it and you wanna dig into the archives, you can find more conversations with him there. He's done a lot of awesome stuff with his artistic career that we'll get into today. Um, Mike, how you doing? What's going on? How are you feeling I'm, today? I'm doing fine, I'm doing fine. How about you? I'm doing all right. I. Uh, I don't know, to be honest. I, that's a, <laughs> that I could take over the whole conversation just with how I'm Sorry, doing. Sorry, I shouldn't ask. I shouldn't <laughs> ask. Okay. Never mind. Never mind you. I'm doing fine. I'm doing fine. I'm a little distracted at my show and everything, but yeah, yeah. Fine. Well, that's what we're gonna dive into right off the top here. So before, so we have the show coming up. It's called Talking Trash. We'll we'll get into all that um, stuff quickly, but let's um, pretend that there's some, maybe some people that are going to find this conversation that have no idea who you are. So let's yeah. set it up a little bit with, um, how do you define yourself as an artist these days? Like, what is it that you are uh, kind of focused on? And like, yeah, just give us a little bit of that kind of information. Okay. Well, to define myself as an artist these days, you throw in the deep these days part. I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a middle-aged mid-career artist right there. Uh, I think I'm doing pop art, if that's still a thing, if that exists. Uh, that's probably the simplest explanation. I'm doing sculpture, mostly figurative work. I have been sculpting little figures and action figures for a long time. And, uh, you know, that became a real toy production. And so I have these little plastic toys that are being made. Uh, and then over the years, while doing these action figures and large figurative works. I've also been doing other sculpture uh, objects. Like uh, I got started doing cardboard shoes 20 years ago and uh, you know, fast forward to now that's drifted into these DIY projects for people to make their own cardboard shoes. And then uh, for the show that I'm working on now, I have a bunch of shoes going on, but then with the recycled material part of the cardboard shoes i've like gone off on this whole other tangent using the recycled material and the logos and corporate icons from waste packaging to kind of like double down on the pop art bits with these objects that look fun and colorful it looks like i've painted graphics and logos all over them but i'm using salvaged and reclaimed imagery to recreate objects and the sculptures so that's what this show will be uh it's it's kind of a tangent kind of a like a new body of work for me and i have to kind of like resell the whole thing starting from scratch in a way but you know the way i look at it there's like long deep tendrils and threads from a lot of my work for many many years now all right, let's well then let's break it. Let's get let's get nerdy on this whole process of being an oh, artist right. of like the exhibition. Like let's use the exhibition talking trash as a way to like I don't know, I'm a big advocate for how can we use this opportunity to kind of teach in a way, you know, and like and yeah. what what yeah. this process was like for you you're, you're saying you're um you know, there's a lot that you just laid out that we can dig into with, like you said, mid-career artists, you know, what style you might be using pop art, going back to something that you've already done and, and recycling that in a way, and like yeah. kind of fits the theme of the art, um, of the, the yeah. exhibition with um, finding fi found materials and those kind of things. So break down, let's just give us, um, so let's break down the exhibition itself. It's called Talk and Trash. It's happening July 6th through August 18th. What went into like the, and there's like, I, I saw that there's a hundred individual sculptures that you've made for it. So let's talk about like, when you were thinking about this exhibition, what was the first 
kind of steps that you took to get there? Was it, um, I guess, was it a body of work that you were just making and didn't have any plan for? Or were, did you have the exhibition in mind and you had a target? So you're like, let me do this for that target. Uh, it, it came apart, it came about in, in pieces. Like the, the first part is the story of the site itself. So I'm showing in this little art gallery uh, that used to be a gas station that served the north end of Boeing Fields. It's in Georgetown, Seattle's Georgetown neighborhood. So this place was built in the 30s or 40s. And back then, Boeing Field would have been like hot shit, you know, like airplanes, like, you know, and, and then there would have been kind of a neighborhood for the people that actually work at the fields to like live in these houses and this, you know, gas station had a little mini mart. So this would have been like corner store kind of mid century heyday. And, and the architecture of the place is exactly the way you would imagine it. Like a Ed Rocher painting. It's got the overhang roof over the gas pumps, um, small. It's not like a big sweeping, like Southern California, you know, truck stop gas station, but it's a sm small one, same style. Um, it was derelict for 20, 30 years, uh, probably from like the seventies through the late nineties. And this, trio of artists that are our age uh went to cornish the friends of mine they fell in love with the site this like crappy you know decrepit <laughs> fenced off site and they're like had this vision to convert it into this working space um and through like 10 15 years of hard hard ass work uh epa cleanup soil remediation digging out the old like you know, gas tanks and all that, um, they did it and pretty much like rebuilt the entire place from scratch. So it looks beautiful and clean, but then retained the original architecture. So even like the curb for the old gas pumps is still sitting there, no gas pumps. And, you know, they got off all the, you know, whatever, all the old knobs and everything. Anyway, so it still has that kind of feel. That was my first part of like inspiration for this show is like, okay, this is where this work is going to live. Um, it has to be about that in some way. The other part was my my cardboard shoe project had really evolved a lot. And the last few years, it's been all about the teachers and students uh, who were writing me and requesting like templates and how do I make a cardboard shoe because they're doing these things for school projects. It's like a classic school art school project is how to you know, do a cardboard shoe. Um, it's kind of like... It's supposed to be easy. It's easy material. It's cheap, but it's also a really good challenge if you want to make it right. Uh, and apparently, I'm the only one in the world that actually does these things like seriously. I'm, it's still surprising to me. I think there are people that do them well, but um, you know, I post them and you know, I, I'm uploading pictures a lot. So you know, like I'm out there. Um, so I get written to constantly from from like 12 year olds in England. Who were like you know how do i do this can you teach me how to do this over an email and you know i can't can't do the you know every once in a while okay here's how but so uh, i started building templates and how to booklets and you know tutorial videos um for the cardboard shoes that's all been kind of like slowly steamrolling over the last couple of years i got invited to show in this old gas station and so there was this in the middle of that there's some sort of recycled material ecological overlapping. And I didn't really, I couldn't wrap my head around it at first and I'm still not really, but that's, so then I have these cardboard shoes, these, this recycled material, this old, you know, ecological cleanup site. And where do I go from there? Um, the next big step, uh, I was thinking I was going to do all cardboard shoes for the show. I was going to have like, you know, uh, uh, roller skates and, and ski boots. And, you know, I was just thinking every elf shoes, you know, like any sort of the, 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 the shoes from back to the future where, you know, they lace up themselves. I mean, Nike's made real ones, but, you know, I was thinking of any brainstorming ever, you know, it's just going to be this shoe bonanza. Uh, and that was, I was kind of like rolling with that for a little while, but I was in the middle of also kind of like slowly collecting material. So I was starting a dumpster dive before I even started really making anything for the show. 
And I kind of had this general idea is like, I want to make fun of corporations, consumer culture with recycled material. I don't want to just use any old cardboard out of my recycle bin. I want to get like, you know, Marlboro, uh, uh, you know, Rainier Beer, Budweiser, Nike, Adidas. You know, I wanted like the companies that I wanted to kind of go after. I wanted their packaging and I wanted to reform that. So I'm already dumpster diving. You know, I have these kind of bigger components going on. And I was sitting there in the middle of Costco one day with a box of Disney apples. <laughs> okay, so I have, like, I, and I couldn't unpack this. I'm sitting there like, you know, the buzz of like busy Costco is like, swirling around me and I'm holding this box with Mickey Mouse's, you know, all over the face for, for organic apples. I'm like, what, what is going on here? This is, this is wrong. This is bad. And I want to take this box and make something out of this. And I, at the time, it was Ron DeSantis, uh, Florida. He's he's fighting Disney, and you know. And then there's mass shootings going on, and that's when the the kind of bell went off for me. You know, this guy, the governor, and actually, you know, many elected officials in Florida are are actively opposing gun control, while the governor is opposing Disney. So I'm like, what if I make? I want to make. I, in the middle of Costco, I'm like, I'm going to make an AR-15 out of this box. So I, you know, I went home and started probably the next day on that. And that just turned out badass. And then the whole rest of the show kind of fell into line after that. Like, this is not going to be just about cardboard shoes. This is going to be about other topical things. Um, and I have the, 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 the visual kind of vocabulary now of these stacks of boxes all flattened out, cigarettes, beer, soda, whatever. Um, toppling, you know, getting adding on to the story of the sites. Um, and it just the, the shoes were still going to be a big part of it. So I'm like, well, I can still make fun of Nike and Adidas and all those big players. But then I'll stop talking for a minute unless you ask me another question. <laughs> the last big part of the story was. Um, I was I started to find a real nice strong narrative for each piece and a real deep reason why I'm picking the packaging mm -hmm. for each object that I'm making. And that's when it really like, okay, now I feel like I got my hands in something really strong and big. And at this point, I I, I feel like this is this is the strongest work of my career. I mean, I, I don't I think I've done maybe better sculpting or something, but um it just feels like I'm, I've kind of like dipped into something really powerful. Um, so I do want it to get out and I want to like get people to see this work because um, it just feels like there's, there's, there's a lot here and it's a good story. I, I feel like in a good way, it's not as much about me. It's always a self portrait, but I just, I don't know. I feel like I kind of landed on something uh, that, that people need to see. Okay. So we got a great overview of the, sort of expectation of the show, kind of the motivation about why you're doing it. Um, one piece that I, I wasn't quite clear on is like, so you, you you knew the site and you were making, so you were making work specifically for the site in a way, yeah, and it was yeah. kind of timed there's up. A lot of, there's a lot of gas related pieces, yeah. uh, fossil fuel industry. Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah. So how long did that, what was that timeline? Oh, okay, uh, pretty, I'd say a few months. I started okay. any show like this where I'm doing a solo show. I'm I try to set out. I used to I used to do like three solo shows a year, yeah. just crazy, you know, like four months at a time, which is just I don't even know how I did that because that you know it's a it's a pace that you have to really keep a strong clip because it's not just about making the work; it's about photographing. Yeah, yeah. you know, like making an inventory and all that uh, packaging, shipping and all that, uh, framing, whatever it is. Uh, so now, and then I used to, okay, I need, now I need like, I used to think uh, six months for a show. And, and then and now I'm like, oh, I need a full year okay. to do a solo show, no matter what it is. So I started last, yeah, last July, um, dumpster diving material, brainstorming. And so from that point up until like that Costco moment, maybe a few weeks after that, when I started to really kind of brainstorm a, a sharper list of pieces that I wanted to make, it was probably like three or four months, okay. really. 
So it was a slow roll for me. Like normally I have a strong idea set out a year in advance and I pretty much brainstorm the whole show, the whole the list of pieces I want to make. And I just start clocking them off one after another. This was a little slower because um, I didn't feel that strong about it at the very beginning. Okay. And then so talk to us a little bit about the the show itself. Now we're going to, you know, we want to get people there, right? Um, what are you doing else besides you know talking to me and hopefully we can spread the word a little bit but like what do you do to help um like get the word out for one but also just looking at the show itself i noticed you had the like reception date kind of sort of in the middle of the show versus a beginning or ending like what was the decision making around that as well uh that was up to the gal the the, the opening reception is up to the gallery uh okay. that, that was um I, I, well, okay, so the Georgetown Art Walk, the Art Attack, happens to be the second Saturday of every month. So there's that piece. So my party is is that same date. Okay. Um, that's why that it's like starts the, the party is like a week after the actual opening. Um, and at first I'm kind of like, eh, that's weird. But then I'm actually thinking the advantage. There's an advantage there. Like, you know, the doors will be open to the gallery, but you know, it can be kind of like, I got like a five day kind of like momentum I can try to build. And if something doesn't feel right at the very beginning, like I'm not getting any publicity or no one's really interested, I can like maybe do something to try to help that. Yeah. Um, but also just, it's just kind of a softer rollout. Um, you know, I really, it's, I want to try to build up a crowd for the opening. Um, but ultimately I, I need to make money. So I want to make sales. Uh, so like a, a huge part of this and what i'm in the middle of doing right now is building a shop an online shop for everything uh so yeah i don't know how deep we want to get in the mechanics of all that that's um, fine i'm just i mean maybe if it comes up again just to, you know that's yeah. that's a good motive i mean so i can i only so i'm in this world too but obviously at a different place different kind of angle with it and thinking about like for me like the exhibition like I, I don't plan to sell anything ever so it's like it's like just doing the exhibition is kind of like a uh it's like, that's yeah. like the thing but like looking at it through the lens of like okay how do i make this exhibition sustainable right and that i mean that's a goal eventually yeah. too so yeah um and just hearing you say that it's like okay you want to make this somewhat sustainable so that it's not just just art for art's sake it's like art for sustainability a little bit for yourself as a career artist and those kind of things so and I guess the question, I want to make sure we've covered everything that like anybody would want to know about the show itself specifically. Yep. Um, do you think there's anything that you want to make sure people know, like, um, you know, coming into the show or um, ideas around it that we haven't covered? I think we covered a pretty good idea of it. I mean, everything's for sale. Okay. <laughs> you need to know that. <laughs> I have cheap stuff. I have stuff. I, so, uh, okay. So, these are little juice boxes that I've made out of all recycled material. Um, and you know, the idea is that this is, this is the, the, you know, template for a kid's juice box. Uh, but that I made 50 of these things. Okay. None of which we should allow our children to drink. I mean, I've got like Clorox bleach, I've got Tide pods, I've got uh, hard alcohol, uh, even like Coca-Cola, Mount, Mountain Dew, you know, Diet Coke, all the stuff you'd never want in the juice box. I've got all of it. Uh, and these guys are cheap. These are 80 bucks. Or actually, these are only 40 bucks a piece. Uh, I've got uh, Happy Meals made out of totally fucked up material like uh, Camel cigarette boxes. Those are 80 bucks a piece. So, uh, and then uh, I did a, a series of Chinese takeout containers, the little ones. Uh, but made out of the packaging from corporations that are heavily reliant on trade with China. Mm -hmm. uh, so like Apple, Nike, Adidas, uh, you know, uh, so Walmart, uh, and those are cheap also. So, and that's actually like of the hundred and something pieces I've made for the show, that's like 75% of the work. So what I have for people, that is available is a lot of very affordable work. I also have these other 30 something pieces that are, you know, nice and expensive and handmade. Um, 
that I'm going to have on the wall mm -hmm. with little metal plaques. You know, these are these are collector items. Mm -hmm. um, the shoes, especially, like you know, there's all kinds of shoe geeks out there that spend easily five hundred dollars a pop on shoes that they never wear. <laughs> but they admit, they, you know, they'll admittedly tell you this, and you know, they they're all self conscious and self aware. Uh, so I have something for them too. <laughs> Um, the other, the, the, the part of that, which I think is important, um, actually, I should grab one. It's going to be one thing. Yeah. Mike will be back with us in a moment. We get to see his studio space a little bit more there. Okay. This is a small one that I made for the show. I have about, I think I have about 15 shoes in this show. So this is for my template for Converse Chuck Taylor. I should just run through this one piece as a small example. Um, this is made from packaging from the Hershey's Corporation. Twizzlers are made by Hershey's. I, I know you're a sports fan, so you're going to run with me on this. Um, Will Chamberlain, when he scored 100 points, uh, that, that that I don't know if you have been reading this, but that that's actually been somewhat disputed fact because like we don't have like concrete footage of that actually happening. It's like become like the moon landing. Thing. I mean, it's all BS. I don't buy into any of it. I think it's completely silly, especially for a sports thing. It's like, fine, you guys go ahead and run your conspiracy theories about Wilt Chamberlain's 100, 100 points. When he scored 100 points the night he was he, that night, he was wearing a pair of Converse All Stars, Chuck Taylors. Uh, at that point in the like Chuck Taylor converse, uh, you know, evolution, uh, Chuck himself had been hired by converse right around this time. And converse was trying to like make a name for themselves. And so that's why they brought Chuck in. Uh, it was a big deal for them when he scores a hundred points in 1962 or whatever, suddenly the Chuck Taylor becomes like the shoe for basketball players to wear. Uh, they were already kind of like, you know, all over the place at that point. But anyways, this is a big moment for them. Uh, he, <laughs> the game was played in the town of Hershey, Pennsylvania, where the Hershey's company was founded named for the cor corporation itself. So that's why I have this one. <laughs> and I have a whole Reese's pieces, Chuck Taylor too. Uh, I'm just like running through that one piece because that's the kind of thing and research and story I found for every single piece in this show. Yeah. Um, there's a real like through line for everything. Um, so these little metal plaques that I'm making to hang on the wall kind of tell some of the story. And a lot of that for some of these things becomes about um, consumption. Like for the Air Jordans, I'm using cigarette cartons of tobacco companies from North Carolina, where Michael Jordan is from. And for some of them, like I'm making like basketball player size, like Shaq size Air Jordans, like huge ones. For some of them, uh, when I did the math for the amounts of cigarettes that had to be smoked, for one shoe, I, quick math, it was about 16,000 cigarettes were smoked to make one Air Jordan. Uh, and for a lot of these things, it becomes about that. And it's, you know, I, at first I wasn't really thinking about it, but while I'm making these things, I'm you know, gluing these cartons one after another. I'm like, wait a second, there's 20 packs, 20 cigarettes per pack. This is disgusting. This mm -hmm. is horrible. You know, like I actually started to get like a little sick to my stomach. Um, so I'm kind of trying to make that part of the story too, you know, that I'm just like reeling off these little pieces, but like I pulled these out of a dumpster and those things went through somebody else's body, <laughs> a lot of them. And for like a regular smoker or a regular drinker or a regular, you know, soda drinker, this kind of consumption is nothing, daily occurrence. And it happens so often, they're buying these things at gas station mini marts. Don't go to the grocery store yep. because they don't, like, so I'm on Vashon, I'm on the island, it's a small town kind of rural area, we basically have one Chevron station. And so I have this weird beat on all the cigarettes that are smoked, the most popular beer and alcohol, like out of one recycle, recycle uh, dumpster. Uh, it just, I don't know. I, 
<laughs> did, did the uh, owners of the recycle bins know that you were doing this or how did that work? No, I don't think they care. They have such a high turnover. Like things are getting tossed out there so much. Yeah. But they don't know. And I, I pull in, I pull out a, a few things at a time, but it's, no, it's, they, they didn't really care. I, I think a couple of times they noticed me pulling stuff out, but they're like dumping more in. They're probably just like, cool, thanks for making some space. Yeah. Uh, yeah it, it, there's, there's another part of this story with the, with the consumption bit. Um, I think what I've, what, I've, what I've found that's unique also is about these, the, 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 the corner store, the bodega, the 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 gas station mini mart is where people go to get the vices that they're ashamed of yeah especially in a a place like this is relatively rural you don't go to the grocery store to buy your cigarettes and beer because that's where you're going to run into the people you know you're it's a longer stop you're kind of lingering all your stuff is in your cart you go to the gas station you get in and out real quick (laughs) get your gas you know and just go so all your vices are kind of like, you know, packed away and, you know, just not really, you know, part of the rest of your life. Yeah. I I wonder what that means for art being sold out of a gas station. What kind of vice do we have? What are we doing anyways? <laughs> it's like, there's a, there's a meta commentary there or something as well. Right. Yeah, totally. Totally. There's so much like, so there's so much that you just talked about that i could there's you you started on 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 um, places that i'm interested in but the one i think i want to target first or tackle first is this idea of like obviously your work is based on a their social commentary right um which to me connects to i want to ask you maybe start thinking about this idea of how you personally define art in a way Mm -hmm. um and but because for me defining art has there's like, you have to have something to say as part of that definition. So it really feels Ooh. like you have something you want to say. It feels like you're thinking that like, there's this, this idea of what you want to say, but in that journey, maybe, maybe you like think back when you started this process of being an artist or where did that seed get planted? It's like, when did you start to feel comfortable, I guess, having these social commentaries, these potentially polarizing ideas. And when did you start to say, I like for you, for me, I feel like I have to say it, you know, I feel like I have to, I want to amplify ideas that I think are important to amplify. So it's like, there's this kind of like, I can't not, you know, I, I don't care, you know, in a way. So I'm just curious about like, for you, like when you started this journey and the kind of, you know, you've probably gotten feedback on both sides of the spectrum, like, what the hell are you doing? And then also like, thank you for doing this or like, there's like that. So I guess the question in there is like, when did you start feeling comfortable or what, what mode? Okay. First, what motivated you to want to have a commentary, use your art to make commentary. And then how did you basically feel comfortable keeping that kind of tradition going? Um, well, I, I totally agree with you on kind of like, if you, if you're going to say, I don't know, this, is what, this isn't what you said, but but the same sentiment. If you're going to say anything, say it loud and have something to say. Um, I think a, a big part of the motivation for me is kind of being out of the game for a while. Like, you know, my my, my life was has just been like this weird, the, the last six, seven years pre-COVID, it was my dad passing, mm-hmm. having my first child, and then COVID. And like this whole kind of like, you know, like I talked to you before we started, like, you know, this kind of slowing down, but for me, actually actively disengaging. Um, also, on top of those more personal things, my New York dealer, my last, I was showing in a, like, badass, awesome New York gallery in Chelsea regularly. <laughs> like, I did, what, three or four shows in the span of, like, five years, and they were going really well. Um, and then he goes out of business in 2016. That was right when my dad got sick. And so I was kind of just like, what am I even doing? I don't even know if I care about this anymore. Um, and so I really, really kind of like drifted back and let myself kind of like fall away from all of it. Um, now, when I got invited to do the show last year, I was already kind of like feeling like I should be back into this. But the big question is why? And what do I have to say? And why would I want to be back? And most importantly, why would I ask for anyone's attention? Why would I ask 
for, and this is definitely post 2020 George Floyd. Uh, why would I ask anyone to look at a white guy as a, at a privilege? I am, I am very privileged in many ways. You know, I, I'm not going to ask you to look at my work because I'm making something pretty because I'm painting flowers or a landscape. If I'm asking for your attention, I'm going to give you a reason to look um, and, and deliver something. So in a way, I felt like the, the, the motivation is, and it's totally like to your point of like, it, there has to be something strong there. Uh, so that, that was a big reason why I, I was like, I, I, I have to drift into politics. Um, there's, there's no other real way about it. And I've kind of dabbled with that for a long time. Even the action figures, I mean, they were all political candidates. Um, and, you know, it's, I've kind of been wrestling with that, like, should art be political or not thing for a long time. So I've been kind of stealing myself for that for a long time. Um, and it hasn't been easy. And I'm not fully, what, at peace about it. Um, it just feels like in a way there's there's really not a lot of other way about it. Um, this, I'm, I'm going to jump on a tangent for a second, but just the, the book I've been reading uh, currently is um, another sports related thing. Uh, it, it's it was called the, it's called the Kaepernick Effects. Um, mm. It's a sports writer guy who actually um, started writing. He did a he did a history of sports uh, from Howard Zinn's People of the uh, People's History of the U.S. You remember that book? I, I, very, I, sorry, the, okay, <laughs> never mind. Okay, so uh, early '90s or late '80s, Howard Zinn. Uh, he's a historian. He wrote the People's History of the U.S., which is like the the kind of like the gritty underbelly of U.S. politics and government. Um, but written from like citizens' perspective, so it was a lot of it was about labor movement, um, just and, and it became like this template for uh, other writers to do a history of such and such and such and such. And so this guy, uh, I think his name is Dave Zarin, is the author. He's a sports writer, and you know he's probably like a columnist doing some beat for like some local paper. But he got permission from Howard Zinn to the People's History of Sports, and it was all about political activism. Um, and he gets deep into like you know Muhammad Ali and and all these other characters. This book is his follow, kind of a follow up. Um, it wasn't. I thought it was about you know Colin Kaepernick himself and like his own evolution, but it's not at all. The book is about all the other high school and college student athletes that were inspired by Kaepernick to take a knee. Also, and it's actually incredible. Because to read he's, he's got a lot of first person he's just asking them th for their stories and what's happened to them and the reaction um and this common refrain from young kids student athletes cheerleaders you know football players whatever i mean playing all different kinds of sports uh the common refrain was like i feel this is this is from you know teenagers like people that aren't supposed to be articulate but they felt like they had to do something and they felt like their platform called for it. Like they have people looking at them. So what else are we, are, do you want me to just go around and bounce a ball and try to get it through a net? Is that it? You know, they didn't feel that way. They felt like there's, they, they had a calling to do it. Um, so, you know, I, I'm, I'm not going to compare myself to them because they're stronger and braver than I am, but, but it's the same thing. I feel the same way. You know, what, what, what else, if I'm asking, if I have any sort of platform, a privilege of any kind, and people are looking, what else am I going to do with it? This is, I mean, I fought, I'm a big TikTok user. I, I love to doom scroll on my TikTok. And right now there's with a lot of creators, um, big creators, there's, a uh, that exact sentiment that you're saying, the people that are not big creators are asking big creators to use their platform for something like you've been gifted this platform please yeah. use it to yeah. say something right now the palestine conflicts the big one that people are yeah. wanting totally. to um basically hear the voices of people that are of influence saying like let's stop this genocide you know let's yeah. let's do something here um yeah a yeah. uh, couple things on that so first i want to jump back i'm going to like uh, just respond to some of the points that you made as well with like 
the idea of like um deciding to be political with your art right i'm like a big advocate in a sense of or uh, this idea that art is inherently political even if you're not trying to make it political by just having the sort of audacity to say you're an artist even if you are drawing flowers or whatever it's like you are putting yourself in a position in society that says this is important and in that sense you're making a political statement even if you don't realize it because so much of society doesn't feel art is as important as it really is so for for you just to, to say that so my thing is like well then I want you just to lean into it. Just understand that you are being, a, you are doing this. So just go, just like have a voice. And for me, like I wrote down this idea. It's like uh, basically kind of what you were saying. If, if like, I feel like personally, I've been given this kind of gift to do this. This is like what I, this is what I can do. Right. And if I'm not using it to try to like kind of make the world a better place in some way, then I'm wasting this opportunity in a sense. And like, that's, you know, that's kind of what it is for me a little bit. I think a lot of people and artists, um, can, you know, they, they let fear get, get the best of them. Yeah. Um, I, I think a lot of artists do dabble in it. Um, I, you know, I, that's, that's part of me over the years, like kind of like stepping into politics, getting freaked out about it. Hmm. Like, all right, never mind, fuck it. I'm out. And then coming back in. And, um, I think that middle ground is where you can get stuck. And I think it's really easy to get stuck there. Like, okay, fine, I will make a statement about Palestine. Then you get blowback and you're like, all right, you know, it's not worth it. Um, mm. So I think it's hard because once, <laughs> it's kind of like once you go in, how do you really get out? Um, yeah. And I, so, yeah. And, and that's, that's super hard. I mean, especially for people who are trying to make a career and trying yeah. to make money and trying to get a following and keep a following over the years. It's super hard. I mean, as soon as we, as soon as, you know, I've been working for this toy company, making these action figures. And as soon as we made the Donald Trump action figure, you know, that was 2016 during that campaign, there was a huge rift that just started like, I mean, and it fully mirrored, you know, what's happening in America at the same time, but I could feel it come right down to our little tiny toy production. And it, it, like it came right inside of me too. Mm. Like it was just like, <laughs> and what am I going to do about this? One sense was, I don't want to have any part of this. This is completely toxic. This is horrible. There will be no good outcome for me being a part of this. The other part of me is like, I have to be a part of this. Mm -hmm. I can't do anything else. You know, so, and that wasn't necessarily just about fear. It was like, I could identify that something was entirely wrong and it might never be right yeah. <laughs> again. And at the same time, I have to do something about it. So that's, to me, that's wrestling with two very different beasts right there. So when you are choosing a subject that yeah. has a face, um, yeah. is there anything that goes like into that process that um, makes you decide whether or not you want to basically give your energy to that representation that you feel I don't know good about all I'm going to just kind of leave that a little vague because I have an answer for it for myself that I'll tell you, but yeah. I want to see what your answer is. Tell me the question again, because that was a good one. So if you know, you do a lot of portrait, like, you know, sculptures of people, like actual people, right. That are in the world. Yeah, yeah, so it's like yeah. when you're deciding to represent them in your art, like, do you have any lines that you are like not willing to cross because of certain ideas that you're like, I will never, or I will, or how I decide to approach this is very contingent on something, but these yeah. faces, there's like a rule. Do you have any rules yeah. about why you choose what you choose? Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh, there, there's, there's politics within the politics for yeah. sure. And I think it, it is when it, when it comes down to the faces, political candidates, political celebrities, whatever it is, personalities. Um, yes. There's a whole nother layer of can do this, can't do that. If you do this, then this will happen. Um, I mean, what the way we decided to deal with Trump was one was one good example. I, mean, I think the better examples actually are the women that we've, you know, like did Kamala Harris, AOC. Um, do we make them smiling? You know, like, is that, is that, does that like, disempower them somehow if we they just have to be these happy little people 
Um, do we make them serious? Well, then are they too angry? Like we did, we we did a Mich- Michelle Obama action figure. Never hasn't seen the light of day, but you know we got into that again. Well, is she just going to be seen as this angry black woman if we make her not smiling? You know. So yes, totally to your point. Yes, there is a lot of like um, decision making that can go on in that, and it's and it's all very political. Um, mm-hmm. What I've found, you know, like. The, for this body of work I'm doing on this show, I think has also been a nice release for me and a nice escape from all that because I'm not, I'm not, it's, it isn't about people and personalities. It's about big corporations and they're like, they're fair game. Like there's no face to that. It's just these, yeah, faceless bohemists that, you know, so what? So, so there's some like Disney lovers out there that might be a little offended and it's like, well, you're not really gonna hurt a lot of feelings that way um so it's been kind of nice in that way like there's a lot of common enemies a lot of like easy targets uh familiar foes you know like the bad guys and the good guys um so it's been for me i think that's allowed me to lean in a little heavier on these things and make it more about the topics and the issues which, um, in a good way, which I like, uh, because you can get wrapped around the axle when you're dealing with faces and people. Yeah. Would you define your work, a lot of your work as satire? Yeah, I try to. I mean, okay. I love it. I love yeah. it. I, 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 I want to be a satirist. Yeah. Um, you know, a lot of my work isn't necessarily, especially like the, like that last show I did in New York was 2016. It was film directors and, yeah. um, there was a lot of like homage there. I really love these people, but also making fun of them. Like, you know, I'm dementing their bodies in different shapes. Uh, so even then, you know, like the making fun of them was a lot more lighthearted because there was some love going on there too. Uh, but that's, I mean, that's the way I'm with good friends and family. Like, you know, that's how we get along in a way. Yeah. I mean, a little bit of lighthearted humor, uh, I think I think it's another role of art and artists is is to is to be that comedian and and I think that's a good thing get people laughing. Mm-hmm. I know that there's there's conceptual artists and art historians that want art to be serene and serious and it shouldn't be too funny otherwise it's an editorial comment and it's not like you know I don't know important or whatever. Um, I'm not, I'm not down with all that. I, I think, I think it's, it's one way to disarm people in a good way, mm-hmm. get them laughing about something, especially if it is something serious and heavy, um, then, then it should be satire. It should be a parody. I'm going to, so if you don't mind me answering the same question for myself, because <laughs> do, please do. I'm going to, um, I'm doing an artist talk, like I said, before we started soon. So this is something that I do want to address in my artist talk. So it'll be good practice for me as well. <laughs> Cause some of yeah. the same things. So first off, I think that line of satire is something that helps define which direction you can go as well. Um, because I'm trying to, I try to stay away from satire with my work. But I do flirt with it at times. I, I have a couple pieces that deal with like the cult of personality with politicians and trying to like overblow them, you know, like trying to go that direction. But it's yeah. still I still follow this kind of general rule of like when I'm deciding to draw somebody with a face, it's about um, if I can't align with them in some way, then I can't I can't give them my energy. Like I can't draw like I can't do a drawing of Trump or something like that. Like, wait, wait, wait. So you haven't done any uh, bad guys portraits? Um, I have, but it's, yeah. I'm still, there's like, it's a navigation, right? That I did a big yeah. piece. I did this really big piece around the Ahmad Aubrey trial. Um, yeah. the, the one Kyle Rittenhouse, that, that the whole situation with uh, Jacob Blake and Kyle Rittenhouse, that. And then there was the, at the same, around the same time was the assembly bill eight, I think out of Texas where this abortion ban stuff was really starting to get kind of rolling. So I did this yeah. really big mural like piece with a lot of different faces. But the way I justified that was it was the collection of all the faces. But when I'm doing yeah. a singular face and I'm giving that energy, it's, I will never draw like the bad guy, you know, in yeah. a way. Okay. So that's, I, yeah. yeah. It's, I, <laughs> It's it's so good we're getting into this because uh, I, I spent 
just from sculpting so many different faces, I get so deep into it. I, it you're painting and you know, you're going to spend just as much time as I do. It's just that, um, to, for me to capture the likeness, I have to go like deep into their soul. Mm -hmm. And I'm not just looking at pictures. I'm like reading up on them and I'm like obsessing about them for weeks at a time yeah. just to get myself in the headspace. A lot of times before I even start working at all, um so when i end up doing a bad guy i have to let them in yeah. and it's not good i'm like in a bad mood while i'm doing it because i have to channel something about them I, in order i think to your point about like being able to um, capture them well like, yeah you, you have to align in some way yeah no and that's part of it for me honestly because i'm a very energetic person I, i'm metaphysical i just i have i just believe that kind of element and in order for me to give that energy like you just described you're giving your energy to understand this person it yeah. can take its toll and I'm, I'm just not ready for that part of it maybe at a point in my career i will tackle that yeah. but i think yeah. there's also enough for me of other subjects and other ideas that I'm trying to like the bottom line is I'm like my tagline for my art right now is I, I want to make art to amplify important messages. And so there's mm -hmm. plenty of that to go around. So it's like finding these ideas. And so within that idea, I go, okay, a lot of these important messages deal with like people of color. And so then it's like, okay, how do I have the right to draw a person of color as a white male artist, as we've already brought up a little bit, there's that kind of conversation. And so with when it comes to like black people in particular, because of the relationship in our society with the, the, the kind of um, oppression and the kind of sort of violence around, you know, when they have lost their lives or something like you brought up George Floyd is another one. This is where it started with me. I did draw George Floyd, but it was before I started having this conversation to myself about, is it appropriate for me to draw George Floyd? So it's like this ex potential exploitation of, of like black violence, you know, th that kind of idea for, for my purposes as an artist. So it's like, okay, so I made this line where I won't draw anybody that's lost their life due to these subjects that we were talking about. So like Colin Kaepernick, I'll have to read that book that you brought up. Colin Kaepernick is sort of my muse because he fits the profile of what I'm willing to draw. Like I want to amplify these voices and um, he's still alive and he's doing work in the, the area. And it's like, it was a big cultural moment with the kneeling and all those kind of things. So that's a very good example of what I will enter into. And then like the smiling idea you brought up is something that I think about a lot too, um, but in a different way where I try to find a picture, everybody I draw is smiling. Like I try to make sure they're smiling in every drawing. So it's like I'm amplifying this joy in a sense versus this necessarily pensive mode. I don't know. I don't know. I just like it too. <laughs> yeah. yeah, totally. So it reminds me of like, um, I mean, we're getting into this, like basically portraiture uh, and And, and political subjects or, 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 you know, real, real people, real life people yeah. that are out there in real life. Um, there's something also about the, the actual capturing, like that you're actually to, to capture like there, that's a, that's a, that's an active word there. Um, like the way that, you know, some like native people mm -hmm. don't want their photographs to be taken. Like there's something that there's part of their soul that actually gets stolen once it's captured. Um, so you and I are sitting here doing that mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, to, to do it right, to make it look right. We're taking the reaching in and actually grabbing a bit of, <laughs> uh, and it's, so I think it's fair for you and I to wrestle with this, yeah. uh, that it's, you know, it's not easy. It's it not like totally safe to do a uh, little bit of danger involved um and it's hard like it's not it's technically hard like really technically hard uh and i think with with the real people people active in politics you know for for a person like for an artist like you or me to do it regularly one after another you know, it doesn't i don't think it i don't know if it ever gets easier uh with practice mm. what about i'm gonna move us to process versus mm -hmm. the idea a little bit so in this because some of the words you've been saying is like kind of bringing up this kind of 
uh, idea for me. Like I've gotten to this point, I've been doing a lot of portraits. <laughs> I've been it, like so much so that like at times, so I have this other saying about art where I believe art is like a form of alchemy. It's like, you know, I think sculptural work is very, um, it's, I don't know. I think there's a direct line to this as well, where you take a block of whatever, or, you know, whatever you're doing and you form it into something that means way more than that original block. And that's basically what kind of alchemy is in a way. And say, for my drawings is the same kind of idea. It's like this, this magical process that happens that just like, it's all of a sudden becomes something that I didn't even really have ultimate control over it. And that's what I'm thinking about. Like these days when I'm drawing, I can't even always consciously like, do the drawing it's like there's this like thing that like takes over and i like i kind of black out sort of during the process and i'm like and then i wake up when it's over and look at it I'm like how how did that it actually turned out great but i don't know why you know is there anything for that with your since you've done you know you've been artistic for so long is there anything like that for you when you're in your mode of making do you just get like when do you get into your zen mode or how do you get into your zen mode um uh, i yeah, somewhere in the middle. I think it's I think it's a good sign for you that you're focusing on the actual light and dark. Yeah. I mean, really you're, you know, to me that's the way I think about it. it as long as I'm focusing on 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 proportions and, you know, yes, the way light and dark hit a face, uh, you know, aligning the things right, then I will slip into that Zen mode and I'll be like suddenly, you know, nailing a likeness and I won't even realize how I got there because yeah. I'm focusing on form and pattern and, you know, I'm not thinking about those other things. And then, yeah, just like you, I'll look at it later. I'm like, damn, how did I even do that? Um, but that's because I'm like staying right through, on, you know, all the, all the art school stuff, you know, that, that yeah. we're trained with. Um, I mean, I didn't have that much, but enough where, you know, I will fall back on that. And that's when I'll slip into that mode. Um, the, the other thing, the alchemy thing made me think about um, when I'm taking all my process photos these days, I, I pretty much take a picture of like every single stage. I mean, like multiple pictures every day. Uh, and with the figures, I, I wonder if I talked to you about, about this before. Um, there's always a point where I'm like, the blob of clay is going like, and there's always a point. So I'm taking a photograph every single stage. And there's always a point when the camera says that's a face mm -hmm. and it suddenly focuses and it changes the light and the white balance all of a sudden, because it suddenly, and, but, but the photograph before that, it was like, no, that's not a face. That's just a blob with a, like a nose and an eye dimple. And then like, well, there's one step in the camera. It's like, Oh, there it is. <laughs> I, I actually, that's like that same experience. <laughs> This is great. That same experience in a lot of ways happens to me where I'm just, you know, photographing things or doing whatever. If I'm using my foot, my, my phone to do it, cause it has all that facial recognition stuff yeah, and I'm yeah. taking photos around my studio. Cause as you see behind me, I have a bunch of face and it starts to like pick up. I'm like, Oh, I must be doing something right. I don't know. <laughs> like, the real person. <laughs> yeah. Like I'm like, Oh, okay. This is cool. I like what happened here. It's like, I, yeah, it's so cool. There's, I, I have noticed though that, and I've sculpted enough faces that, um, there, I think the tech behind that is a little racist because mm -hmm. it has a hard time and sexist. It has a hard time, harder time picking up a black person's face okay. or a darker face. Probably. I mean, we'll give it the benefit of the doubt probably cause it's darker, not capturing the light as much, but they got, they got some work to do there. The technicians behind that facial recognition for sure. Oh yeah. I took, I mean, we know this, there's just, it's like. I mean, basically white supremacy through all society in a way. It's like, yeah, yeah. it's like I took a film class a while ago and all the light meters are based on our skin versus yeah, dark skin. Yeah, you know, totally. it's like, there's just all that. And then, and yeah. then, yeah, we, yeah, yeah that, that's a whole yeah. another rabbit hole. Yes. Yeah. Another rabbit, good one, but yeah, yeah. deep yeah. one. Well, well, we should have it sometime. I do want to ask a little bit about your career so you've you've kind of sprinkled in your career as an artist as you've gone along you've just you explained you're kind of like you had those moments through the pandemic and your father passing and you having the kid and kind of trying to now maybe it sounds like you're trying to like sort of ramp up again a little bit and like because i i'm i've i've been following you from afar for a while you know it's like oh mike's doing this thing i was when you started when i started seeing your work back when you were doing your new york galleries and the figures more and those and those things i was 
doing my music thing so i was like kind of like oh that's cool that he's doing that but now i'm in it too and i look back on your career as a different kind of from a different lens right i'm like looking at it differently and so i just wanted to get a little bit go a little bit deeper into what you were describing as like you know what what is i guess i guess we can ask just what are the things you've learned along the way that is helping you maybe possibly achieve what you're trying to go for now if you're and like it sounds like you had a little bit of kind of maybe a moment of like um the motivation dropped a little bit and and if you're trying to find that motivation again or you found it again like how, what helped you get back into that space um i don't know does anything like I guess like the question, what is the question I want to ask is like, what, what, it, what have you taken from what you've done and what is it now that you're trying to do? Uh, yeah, there was, I, uh, you remember Paul Hegdahl? Yeah. 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 Uh, I, I saw him, I think it was, well, I, I still see him, but it was, I, I remember hanging out with him at some point right after dad passed. It was a few months after and Paul was the one that was an old friend of ours from high school. He he brought up, he's like, he's one of those guys who's like brutally honest, and that's why I love him. Uh, you know, he was going through, you know, he's in a financial career. He's very different uh, career arc, but same age and thinking. Remember, he brought up the idea. He's like, you know, Mike, I think I've reached peak ambition. Mm. <laughs> this is at like age 30 or 40 or something, or 39 or 40. And I was, and right when he said it, I was like, ooh maybe i didn't realize that was a thing and maybe that was me and um and what i've realized since that was now whatever it is seven years ago um i don't it, there could be a peak to ambition but it, i don't think if you i think if you really have it it never really goes away because what i'm feeling is it's definitely there and it's still strong i still have a drive it's pushing me you know i'm i'm like working late at night after dinner, after the kid goes to bed, I, you know, waking up really early and, you know, I'm, I'm working, I'm, I'm suddenly finding myself, you know, like very driven, um, probably not, you know, at the peak point, but I'm, it, it's coming back to me. So there's that. Um, one thing I'm learning is that, uh, I can still rely on that mm -hmm. for sure as motivation. Um, I mean, where do I want to go with this? Well, I, I need to like refire the engine from scratch. I mean, I, from not having the gallery in New York um, is, is a real problem because I didn't actually establish another dealer or gallery in the process of that falling apart. Um, and I don't really have one now. Like this place I'm showing at now is actually working on a nonprofit uh, model. So they're getting grants and, and benefactors and they don't really care if the art sells that they're showing every month i mean it's good but they're not relying on that to pay the rent uh so this place will, is a great outlet for me um maybe i can get another show there uh but really i need to like sell work and make money or get like commissions get another show lined up somewhere hopefully step up like maybe get into like small museums mm -hmm. or you know a a, a, a a like somewhat of a bigger gallery out of town i mean you know i'm kind of like redoing the whole thing over again i mean i i had my first show at a real gallery in seattle back in 2004 i was like two years out of college and from that point i got to a gallery in la and then from la i got to a gallery in new york a small little tiny gallery in the back of a nightclub in the lower east side and then worked from that place you know, a little further up the east side and then eventually got into Chelsea, you know, like, so there was a real kind of defined stepping stone thing for me back then. And I feel like I kind of got to do that same thing all over again. Does it feel like you, it may not I'm be. Not, hey, hey, I'm not complaining about that, by the way. No. This is like, I just, this is just, I'm, I'm just noticing like, you know, uh, because I do have it within me and the ability to, to kind of redo that, but it's really like, I gotta start from scratch again. But does it feel like total scratch though? Because of, I mean, knowledge is there. Well, yeah. But but do you have, do you yeah. think there's connections that could help you that you've got? Network, network? Networking connections could be one thing. Like, it's weird. We've all like, the people I know, we've all aged together. Yeah. <laughs> so one thing I'm noticing is that, you know, the, 
the boomers and like those our parent generation are older, you know, they're getting really old. Some of them are like, you know, not either they've passed or they're not active in the scene anymore. So I don't have those necessarily to rely on. The younger generation, I don't even know. I yeah. mean, like I'm trying and I want to know them. I think they're great. I think they're all doing great work, but like I'm old to them. Yeah. You know, they're looking to me to help them. And I'm like, dude, I don't know what's going on. You tell me, yeah. <laughs> you know, this, is, this world is yours now. Yeah. Um, so, you know, the, the networking bit is a push pull. I, I have found in Seattle some, some good news with that. Like, you know, there's, there's people that are well-established and, you know, some kind of power brokers, gatekeepers, kind of that, you know, weren't back then just because I maintain a relationship. So there's that. Um, I think the only other thing that I'm carrying through that is not completely from scratch is that um, just a lot of the technicalities and mechanics, like my work needs to be framed. It needs to go on a wall. It needs to, you know, be able to be shipped you know, easily, you know, there's, there's, there's certain things that I really wrestled with for a long time. And like, I don't need to do that. I don't want to do that. That's too some time consuming. It's like, mm -mm. those are the things that work. Those are the things that makes the work sell. Those are the things that people see They're like, Oh, that can go in my wall that helps sell. So, you know, I have learned, there's a lot of kind of like learn the hard way trial and error that, um, I, I can definitely use now. Yeah. Yeah. I'm personally like, I personally grappling in a way with that conversation in terms of do I even want to try to sell my work or not like I would love to I would love to get to a point where my work sold enough that it was actually maybe like it actually I could feel the difference of it you know like I made work and I could pay you know like I made like a third of my income a, a minimum off of it or in a way yeah. you know yeah um but at the same time since I'm doing this professor thing and teaching like if I can keep getting professor gigs or find a place, then maybe I don't even have to worry about selling the work and I can just try to just find places to show it and just do that and whatever happens that way. But so I'm in this weird soup right now yeah. with it, but it's a, but a similar conversation that you're having. Um, I wanted to check in on time. We're an hour yeah. deep. How are yeah. you doing? I can do a few more minutes. A few more minutes. Okay. <laughs> well, let's, Um, I guess, well, I mean, if it's just, I don't really, I have so many more questions <laughs> like what else could I ask about is there anything that um maybe that w as we've had this conversation that's popped into your mind that you're like oh I should mention that or think about that that anything you want to talk about your artwork as a whole that you um we haven't addressed yet I I'm so distracted with the show that no yeah. I mean we've talked enough about this I mean I think you yeah. know I come to my show and buy my work please but besides that no I yeah I'm wondering just this will be my sort of last question yeah. is so you're in the northwest now and mm -hmm. you're trying to reestablish your career as an artist in a way you know i guess it's a way to define it um or yeah. at least the network of your art um mm -hmm. and get into places and get more exposure do you feel your how much does geography play into that um mm -hmm. conversation uh and i'm going to frame it this way so i was heavily involved in the music scene in seattle for a long time and mm -hmm knowing like a lot of musicians would try to start their career in seattle and it was like it was like running in place in a way because it was like sure there's a lot of musicians a lot of great stuff there but there's no industry there and it's like they think they're gonna blow they get i mean you got the people the the, the ones that broke out but it's so few like you know um that in reality it's like does and i'm wondering if there's any parallel with the visual art scene with that like how do you then um, knowing that this is your home base, like how do you kind of navigate that idea? Uh, I mean, the internet really, I mean, yeah. that's, I think that's been, uh, yeah, I, I had a similar experience when I was first getting out of college. Um, and I didn't really, really want to move out of Seattle. I'd, I'd like, you know, been to New York enough to realize that I needed to work there, but that I couldn't live there at the same time. Uh, so I'm like, okay, I feel like I want to stay in Seattle. Um, but I had the same experience of like, uh, I guess in the art scene, I don't know. I, 
honestly, I have no idea what it's like now. <laughs> but 20 years ago, yeah. the way it was in Seattle was that for, for visual art, it was great to get started because there was tons of little cafes and restaurants and bars where you could show anything, anywhere, on just about anything, anywhere. You could like have your work on a wall for people to see with a price tag on it in a lot of different ways. So you could get started just to get like, you know, a little something going to like feel what it's like and how do i frame something and how do i curate a show and that kind of thing uh how do i finish a body of work uh you could do that and get started uh, but then to get from there to anywhere else bets are off because there was just, just weren't enough venues uh, there wasn't enough variety you had like your your serious kind of art galleries maybe one or two kind of like cool fun art galleries with like hipsters going to them but um and then the seattle art museum that was and that's it uh i think there's a lot less of any sort of middle ground right Mm -hmm. now um because there's so many galleries have gone out of business um there's galleries that are just opening that are new but they're not established very well um there's bars and restaurants uh honestly it doesn't look like they really care what's on the wall i think they'll just buy like prints from like some you know poster distributor and put them on the wall uh, and doesn't really matter they just want something colorful there uh and then the museums you know have kind of like you know they've been around long enough and now they're kind of like a step up and so they're like very rarely if ever interested in local artists (laughs) they might pay some lip service to it um and maybe even some money but there's there's just so little of that exposure uh so i don't really see much inroads locally um i mean the way i look at it is that um it's a beautiful place here i love it here i do love the people i mean honestly there's there's a bunch of really smart people doing really interesting things all over the place around here um so for me i'm i'm taking a lot of like deep inspiration from the place from the woods from the beaches from the people and and that that keeps me going really well and i don't but i don't see the seattle and the northwest as a business market for my work i just look at it that way i'm like this is this is what inspires my work and what builds it but i need to sell it like everywhere else here also but and also like and and that's then that's been the beauty of the internet i mean that was also you know 10, 15 years ago, I'm like, okay, I have to do social media actively. I have to be online. I have to be, have a killer website and and just make that part of my work. Okay, let me know if we need to go, but there, that leads yeah. me to a, another whole question. So I was thinking as you were talking about defining Seattle a little bit with the creative industry in a sense, but then also talking about the internet, right? And where you're at personally in your career and what you're trying to navigate. So. So as far as energy goes, and yeah. are you, it's, I'm wondering how important it is. It feels pretty important to have a representation, have a gallery, have shows that are out in the world, but are you yeah. gonna start doing more social work, trying to build up platforms, social, like social media wise, like doing whatever, build your shoes on a you know time-lapse or whatever, I don't know, you know what I mean? Yeah. I, I- Yes, to all that. Yeah. I mean, I, I think um, I don't. I think social media has also changed a lot too. Um, the alg- algorithms have changed. The advertising is a big, big deal. I, I don't really know, but I have like enough millennial friends in the industry to know that yes, it's true. They want money. Uh, they want influencers. Um, you know, political controversy, toxic posts mm. work and they help. Um, but they don't necessarily help the actual users and content creators themselves that much. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's, there's, we, we hear these stories about like 20 year old millionaire influencers who do nothing but post, you know, videos of their real lives, but that's not a lot of people, yeah. you know, there's still like a small gateway to that celebrity, you know? Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, um, I think that that's that's a big change I'm trying to understand. I think I do need to be on social media. Um, I think you got to pay money a little bit and look at it more as like an advertising forum in a way. 
Yeah. Um, even if you're trying to generate like a daily, you know, follow me through this process kind of thing. Um, so there's that part. Uh, the, the other part about having an established dealer or gallery is um, I, what I basically need is is someone else, anyone else to be talking about and selling my work. Yeah. It's really just that simple. It's just not me. It's just someone like right here yeah. <laughs> doing the same thing, saying the same thing I would say, but not me. <laughs> yeah. No, and that's, <laughs> that's the, okay. honestly, that's from my perspective, that's the same conversation that needs to happen on social media as well. It's like you can put as much stuff out there, but unless someone else is saying that too about you, it's you know, it's that influencer kind of idea. Uh, totally. I, I think that's a totally. big deal. But hey, if you ever want to talk more about, I mean, I'm not, I wouldn't claim to be good at it, but I'm deep in it. I'm on those platforms all the time. Yeah. I'm following, yeah. I'm listening, I'm kind of doing it. So if you want to keep talking about it, I'd be happy yeah. to have the conversation. Yeah, we but, should do that. Cause I, yeah, I'm, I'm open to feedback and tips. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Well, Mike, this was amazing. What I'm going to do is um, end the stream, but I'll say bye to you off stream in a second as well so okay all right, <laughs> all right everybody thanks thank you Alex it's yeah been you're, good. you're welcome good. let's keep doing it um and yeah whatever let's keep it going because this is yeah. I'm glad we've stayed in touch over the years and I've loved following your career and now I'm in yeah. it too so you know I why? mean I, I'm sure I said this during the last one but for anyone watching this Alex and I were set sit at the same table in high school right next to each other for like like over a year i feel like it was like two years solid we were sitting right next to each other so it's cool this is like this is very cool to like sit next to you again and this way yeah and maybe I feel so, like it's the only way we could actually do this so what i will um i will be in seattle the northwest this summer at least that's the plan and i'll it'll be during your exhibition so i'll make it out probably i'll i'll go to the reception on the july 13th should be yeah. able to make that so Good. that'd be awesome. All right, Mike, I'm going to end okay. the stream I'm, for everybody else that might be. We had one person, Zach. Thanks so much. Maybe there's somebody here. Um, thanks for watching. And as always, be loving, kind, and patient. Peace, friends. Yeah. All right. Got to end the stream now. Bye.